uh, Graham, exactly what are the pyramids? Okay. Let's first of all deal with the Egyptological orthodoxy. They mm -hmm. tell us that the three great pyramids of Egypt are the tombs of three megalomaniac pharaohs, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare, three pharaohs of the fourth dynasty who ruled at around the period of 2500 B.C. And they say that that's all they are, tombs and tombs only. They say that the great sphinx is a monumental statue that was carved to aggrandize the ego of one of those pharaohs, Pharaoh Khafre, and that the face of the sphinx is carved into his image and that it was created in 2500 B.C. And if you look this matter up in any encyclopedia, or if you read it in any orthodox popular text, such as the National Geographic magazine or the, or the misleadingly named Time Life Lost Civilization series, mm. you'll see the same tired old theory being regurgitated again and again as though it were the revealed truth of God. And nobody ever tells us that that's all it is. It's just a theory. It's just the opinion of a few, a very few, by the way, scholars. It's just their opinion based on no facts whatsoever. The Egyptological notion that the Great Pyramids are tombs is purely and simply a matter of opinion. No burial of any pharaoh has ever been found inside those colossal and extraordinary monuments. They are completely bare. They contain no inscriptions whatsoever. They are stark, austere, and anonymous. They stand out there on the Giza Plateau, begging the intelligent and the curious to work out what they are. But they tell us one thing very definitely about themselves, that they were built by master astronomers and master engineers with skills and talents almost beyond human imagining. The Graham, great Graham, you said that there was nothing in them, uh, at least no burial point. No burials, no, no mummified body ever found, All right, what, no sarcophagus ever found. Gotcha. What is in them? Uh, aren't there chambers and uh, so forth and so on? Now, I've never yes. been there, so I don't know. Uh, All of the three pyramids of Giza have chambers in them, yes. known chambers, and as we show in the message of the Sphinx, as yet undiscovered chambers as well. The uh, two secondary pyramids, the second pyramid and the third pyramid, have just one major chamber each. The third pyramid has a, has a group of smaller chambers as well, and these are underground. They're both, the, the chamber systems are under the ground, under the base of the pyramid, but the Great Pyramid, the pyramid that Egyptologists attribute to Khufu, contains a subterranean chamber, which is 100 feet below ground. Mm -hmm. It contains uh, the so-called Queen's Chamber, and this attribution is purely arbitrary. There's no basis for it, which is in the superstructure of the monument, about 100 feet above ground. And about a further 100 feet above that, there's a third, much larger chamber with a group of smaller chambers above it. These are massive cavities in some cases, inside the body of this six million ton monument. They're joined up by an intricate network of corridors and passageways. And mysteriously, in the Great Pyramid, there are four very narrow shafts, two of them from the so-called King Chamber. These are eight inches wide and eight inches high, hmm. cut all the way through the body of the monument. They rise at an incline, at an angle, and they exit on the outside of the monument. But the two lower shafts from the so-called Queen's Chamber do not exit on the outside of the monument. They stop somewhere inside that vast six million ton bulk. And this, uh, the, the mystery of these shafts is one of the issues that we investigate in the message of the Sphinx because at the end of one of those shafts in 1993, after an exploration by a small robotic camera, was discovered a door complete with two metal handles and an amazing archaeological scandal surrounds what has happened concerning that door and the chamber that lies beyond it and also a chamber that lies deep beneath the Great Sphinx. Thanks. Um, what, uh, aside from when we get down to the very mysterious door and so forth, 
what use do you suppose all these chambers uh, had? What what function? What use? Well, it's going to take us it's going to take us some time to talk this through. This is uh, this is a, a deep and mysterious matter. But there's something that I want to draw attention to right now, and that is the precision of the Great Pyramid. Mm -hmm. Remember that this monument is supposed to be the tomb of a megalomaniac pharaoh. Right. Although no burial was ever found inside it. The Great Pyramid weighs 6 million tons. It has a footprint of just under 14 acres, and it stands more than 450 feet tall. Mysteriously, it is perfectly aligned to true north, south, east, and west. The north-south faces of the Great Pyramid are better aligned to true north and south than the meridian building of the Greenwich Observatory in London. The Greenwich Observatory in London is nine sixtieths of a degree off true north. The Great Pyramid, the last surviving wonder of the ancient world, the oldest massive construction on Earth, is just three sixtieths of a single degree off true north. And this tells us beyond any shadow of a doubt that astronomers of astonishing skill and talent were at work in the surveying and setting out of this amazing monument. And this is the first clue as to its function because it speaks the language of astronomy. And astronomy is a language that can pass and transcend the passage of thousands of years and the change of cultures and symbols. It's a language that any intelligent civilization can decode. If we wish to understand these monuments, we have to look to astronomy. We have to look to the stars. And therein lies the beginning of a trail of clues that leads finally to a conclusion. Graham, uh, at the time the pyramids were built, did we have, did mankind have the knowledge to determine uh, very nearly precisely true north? Well, not according to orthodox history, no. Didn't have the knowledge to do that at all. Um, and also, the question that arises is, when were the pyramids built? Orthodox Egyptologists say that the pyramids were built in 2500 B.C., but that, again, is a statement of opinion. These monuments are made of stone, and you cannot date stone monuments by any objective technique. Carbon right. dating only dates organic material. Right. Therefore, you need to look to other sciences to put a dating on these monuments. And we think that the story of these monuments, the chronology of these monuments, is extremely different to the chronology presented by Egyptologists. And that although the period of 2500 B.C. does figure in their story, it's only part of their story. And that the origins and the genesis of this amazing site go back to 10,500 B.C., 12 and a half thousand years ago, the end of the last ice age, when very strange things were happening on this planet, a time of mystery and darkness about which very little is known, and the evidence that links the three great pyramids and the great sphinx to the date of 10,500 B.C. is astonishingly strong. And we present that evidence in the new book, in the message of the sphinx. I'd like to talk a little bit about that evidence, because if you cannot date to 2,500 B.C., how can you date to, 10, uh, to almost 10,000 years, uh, uh, even earlier than that? Uh, two, two precise sciences. One is astronomy and the other is geology. And as I said a moment ago, it's astronomy that really holds the key to these monuments because what we've discovered and, and what we present is simply this, that the three great pyramids map on the ground the pattern of three prominent stars in the sky. All right, hold, hold that thought, Graham. We'll come right back to it. Graham Hancock is my guest. He's in Chicago. It doesn't matter where you are. You're in for the ride of your life. The modern-day Indiana Jones, Graham Hancock, right back. From somewhere out there, this is Coast to Coast AM on the Premier Radio Networks. From Chicago, Graham Hancock. Graham, uh, where were we? We were in the three stars of Orion's belt. Yes, we were. We were talking about the majestic plan that is transcribed on the ground of the Giza Plateau in Egypt, the plan that Egyptologists, the self-appointed 
academic interpreters of this site have never noticed. Yes. And still to this day regard as, an ex- as, a, as a coincidence if they even accept that it exists at all. To explain this uh, plan, let me first of all preface it with a remark about uh, a huge piece of architecture in the United States. I don't know whether I correctly refer to it as the Boulder Dam or the Hoover Dam. Uh, well, Boulder Dam, I think. Boulder Dam will do. And the state, it's Colorado or... Well, Boulder Dam is down here. It's uh, Nevada, Arizona. Nevada, Arizona. Okay. The Boulder Dam includes an enormous star map. The architect who created that massive piece of architecture built into it a huge star map. He froze the stars above the dam and brought them down into a piece of architecture that he built into the dam. Hmm. And the reason that this was done is very interesting because he knew what the ancient Egyptians knew, that the positions of all the stars in the sky change very, very, very slowly down the ages as a result of a phenomenon called precession. Our planet, which is the viewing platform from which we observe all the stars in the sky, has a very slow wobble on its axis. Mm -hmm. And this wobble operates in a great cycle of 26,000 years. And as a result of this, the patterns and positions of all the stars in the skies change. And the reason that that that, that piece of uh, architecture in the Boulder Dam was put there was so that any future civilization, if ours were to be destroyed, would be able to work out when the Boulder Dam was built. Because if they had a knowledge of astronomy, they could look at that star map built into the architecture and they could work out from that when the star map and therefore the dam was made. And it's the same principle that we find at work in the monuments of Giza. Only in the case of the monuments at Giza, it's not just a matter of dating the monuments. It also helps us to get to grips with what they really mean. Two constellations are represented on the ground at Giza. All right, uh, but uh, 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 Graham, before we uh, get there... Let me understand a little bit better the science of the wobble effect. Yes. In, o- in other words, uh, how we uh, are able to measure uh, without 26,000 years of experience in one wobble cycle, mm-hmm. uh, what standard of measurement do we then use and apply toward being able to date these structures? With very fine and precise observations. Uh, you can note that the wobble is underway over a relatively short number of years. Within a human lifetime of 72 years, this wobble on the axis of the Earth affects a one-degree shift in the positions of the stars. Ancient cultures particularly observed it at the spring equinox. Now, the spring equinox is the time of the year when night and day are of exactly equal length. And it falls in our epoch on the 21st of March. Mm -hmm. And on the spring equinox, the sun rises perfectly due east of wherever you are situated on the planet. This is because our planet revolves around the sun. And there are four key moments in the year. The two other, the the, the winter solstice and the summer solstice are the longest and shortest days of the year. On the summer solstice, the north pole of the Earth, the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere, the north pole of the Earth points most directly at the sun because the Earth lies tilted on its axis. Mm -hmm. And on the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, the 21st of December, the north pole of the Earth points most directly away from the sun. But at the equinoxes, spring and autumn equinoxes, the Earth lies broadside on to the sun in its orbit. Then then one could almost make a structure with a tiny uh, pinpoint hole in it, and on uh, the precise time of the precise day, measure the point where the sun uh, hits? Yes. Of particular, you could, you can, and, and many ancient structures target the rising point of the sun on the spring equinox. Mm-hmm. They point perfectly due east, and one of those structures is the Great Sphinx of Egypt. The Great Sphinx of Egypt is targeted perfectly due east. Its gaze sights the rising sun on the spring equinox. In the New World, if you go to Chichen Itza in the Yucatan, uh, you will find an enormous pyramid, the uh, Pyramid of Kukul Khan, which was one of the names of Quetzalcoatl. I went into this at some length in my previous book, Fingerprints of the Gods. And this wonderful step pyramid at Chichen Itza is also an equinoctial marker because it is so set that on the day of the spring equinox, a wonderful effect of light and shadow is created and a gigantic feathered serpent 
which was the symbol of the civilizing deity Quetzalcoatl, is seen to undulate up and down the staircase of the pyramid. And therefore, even if you've lost touch with your calendar system, if there's been some great cataclysm and you've forgotten how to calculate your calendar, that monument will tell you when the spring equinox has occurred, and so also will the Sphinx. When the sun rises in direct alignment with the gaze of the Sphinx, it's the spring equinox. 